Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. For the few of the people that watch it, you might see my hair is getting really um, bushy. I'm trying to grow it out, looking like a tennis ball before bald is beautiful, so I can get it all shaved off. And so anybody who's interested, they can go baldisbeautiful.org. Um, today we're going to have a two-part show. The first one on alternative sentence and mental health court, and the second one on prescription drugs. So I'm here with my guest. Uh, my name is Tom Nguyen. I'm, right now I'm a project manager for Cheshire County Government. And um, <clears throat> the first part of the show is the new thing that's popping up more and more around the country is mental health courts. Could you tell some of the viewers what a mental health court is? Sure. Mental health court. Um, you hear these terms, <laughs> mental health court. It's derived from uh, what's known around the country as a drug court, where it's basically um, meant to problem solve an issue, specific issue. Obviously, mental health or drugs, um, and you could actually look at them as very related um, because addict addiction issues um, fall under mental health disorders. Um, so we, the mental health court actually in, in New Hampshire um, and in Cheshire County, we were the first uh, mental health court and alternative sentencing program uh, throughout the state of New Hampshire. We began in 2001 with a uh, pilot uh, program and a grant from the federal government. <clears throat> and part of the mental health, what we're saying is sometimes people may commit violentless crimes due to their mental health issues. And right. the idea is to get them treated, not to put them in jail. Right. I mean, you know, if, if you, you step back for a moment and you don't think about who's a criminal and who's not a criminal, uh, you know, when, when you think about it, what, what the reason uh, that police are there and why, you know, in large measure, government is here. We're a safety net. That when things go undetected, like drug issues, mental health issues, the family gets fed up. They don't know what to do. They don't always have money for the services that are provided. They don't know what services need to be provided. And sooner or later, um, they're going to get arrested by the police. And it's not always a um, malicious crime that, that's being committed. It could be a theft to support a drug problem, or it could be, um, you know, assaulting somebody um, because they're being, let's say, restrained and, and uh, there's an anxiety disorder, just, just for example. And so it really is, you know, you talk about first responders and uh, ambulance and, and uh, um, fire and, and police departments. They encounter folks with mental illness and drug problems all the time. Of course they do. Um, and it's, uh, you know, you could say it's a cry for help or uh, that, you know, somebody, something needs to be done, clearly. And so we get this point uh, where they get arrested and it's an opportunity um, for an intervention, really. The um, New Hampshire's working on, I don't know if they, they've done it yet, but a number of other states have called veterans courts. Mm -hmm, sure. Because PTSD is part of the mental health um, s spectrum. And one of the, the problems I guess we're finding out was that <clears throat> a lot of veterans, especially war veterans, were going to jail for domestic violence. It's, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if all of a sudden explodes, pushes the wife, first responders get called in, they're going to bring him to jail. Right. And what is the judge going to do? The judge is kind of limited. And right. You know, to, to a certain extent, <clears throat> Um, when, when you think of tough on crime, you know, there's a big push on tough on crime um, somewhere in the, the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere around that area. Um, and it, it's, it's expecting that people will react to jails the same way that um, any other normal person would act or somebody who, who doesn't have a disorder would react to, to jails, which is, I'm never going to do that again. But that doesn't work for people with mental illness, and it doesn't work, especially when people get sentenced, let's say, 8 to 12 months down the road, far after the fact that the incident has happened. So you get this time delay. And so, you know, if, if, you, get, if you go to jail later, it doesn't always connect for folks. Um, it's just not, not a productive um, function much of the time to, to have somebody um, sit in jail, take away their freedom. And what have you really done? What have you done productive with this person's life? And when, when you talk about being productive, that kind of goes back to your other past life as alternative mm -hmm. sentence. Right. And 
if, if I do something stupid or whatever, a misdemeanor, you could send me to jail for six months, but I don't take care of my family. Right. The family then has to, if the wife or, or the, the significant other isn't working, may have to go to City Hall, mm -hmm. ask for some assistance. Right. And then I get out of jail, who wants to hire me? Exactly. You get all this, you get all this burden, you know. You have to think about what the criminal justice system is there for. You know, ultimately, the number one goal is to stop whatever is happening. Stop the, the unproductive, the um, um, antisocial behavior um, that's happening. And basically, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you do whatever it takes to stop that behavior from happening. And it may mean getting creative about it. And it certainly doesn't always mean punishing the person <laughs> works. Sometimes it works, like we spoke about. Um, but much of the time, and especially with those, let's say, um, you know, the military, like you brought up the veterans' courts, there's a certain culture there. You have to respond to that culture. Um, it, it's a, the cultural competency, let's say. And, uh, you know, and, and those with mental illness and, and people with dysfunctional families or drug problems, you really have to look at the individual, and it doesn't work just to, to throw, throw them in jail or throw the book at them. Because when I was stationed in Southern California, one of the things the courts used to do is, okay, you did something really stupid, you're going to get 30 days in jail. And they would say, well, it doesn't really make sense to put them 30 days in jail. For, so for the next four months, you're going to put the orange jumpsuit on and you're going to be working on the highway during the weekend, mm -hmm. saving the, um, the state money, but allowing the individual to go to work every day and take care of their family. Right. So... You get somebody who was otherwise uh, contributing to taxes, if you want to put it in yeah. that perspective. You put them in jail, and they're a tax burden. And when they get out of jail, now we got to think about the effects that that's had. You've taken them away from their family, their support system. Um, they've learned a culture, an institutional culture, inside the jail. <clears throat> and they've learned that for the past, let's say, four months. They're more used to that, to a certain extent, <laughs> than they are being on the outside. And so we get this pattern of, of, you know, the revolving door, recidivism, you know, being rearrested for whatever crimes. Um, and, you know, it does become more and more likely that somebody will get rearrested once they're in, um, as opposed to taking this opportunity and um, doing something with it where the community's safe, they're productive, the family's more healthy, and they learn how to make better choices going forward. And when you talk about the learned culture, it's kind of like the Marine Corps. Uh -huh. We go in the Marine Corps, we have a learned culture. It never disappears. Right. And you'll run into Marines that may be former Marines who are really pain and not function well in society. Uh -huh. But if they sit down and have a cup of coffee with fellow Marines, it's <laughs> they're comfortable and it's kind of like, how did that person change? Right, right. You, you've, you've communicated them. You've, you've connected with that person. Um, and it's an opportunity in that way. Instead of trying to make them fit, you know, the, the square peg and all that, it, um, you've really got to meet them at, at the level. And so <clears throat> what we're going to do, we're going to go to a quick sure. PSA pretty soon. And um, so before we go, one last thing. What do you think with all the cuts, both at the national and state level, what do you think the future holds for mental health courts or um, <clears throat> just alternative sentence? Well, you know, it, it's incumbent upon any program to show the results. Um, and that's where, where the focus has to be because they're there. You know that they, that, you know, when you talk to people who graduate from the program, certainly, you know, my former clients, they talk about how this has turned their lives around and that they've learned so many things and that they, they've really... Um, you know, hadn't had a, a period of sobriety or being away from drugs or getting actual treatment on a regular basis um, for any length of time before entering into this program. Um, and so it really makes an impact on people. And not just, not just the individual, but of course their family and their, and their kids and, and even on their work lives. So it has just this, this so much potential. And uh, I, I think that, you know, with, with budget cuts, you know, the reason why that alternative sentencing program started was to save money. And so why would you cut that now? It just it doesn't make any sense. You know, of course, our, our jails are getting bigger and bigger, and there are more and more, and, and 
um, to a certain extent. You've just got to wonder why are we warehousing people? And one last, what sure. happens from being a devil's advocate? <laughs> what happens if I go and say, well, wait a minute, you got a 40% failure rate in alternative sentence. What would you say to that? Well, you know, there are folks with uh, chronic, persistent <laughs> mental illness. And uh, failure rate, I mean, to a certain extent, a program sets where that okay. failure rate is. And that's, um, you know, if somebody has, has been non-compliant so much that they have to be um, discharged from the program, that's because there has to be a line somewhere. Or else you're not, uh, you're not really helping the person. You're more enabling the person to continue doing what they're doing, which is being non-compliant. So you've got to set a hard and fast line at some point. You know, there's, there's this um, art to it. You know, it's, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't call it that because, you know, psychology is a science, right? Yep. Um, and, and so the, you have to work with a person. And failure rate isn't everything. Um, there's a learning experience to, to failing for the 40% that fail. And it doesn't mean it precludes them from anything else in the future. But I would say... But on the other hand, that's 60 percent. You've changed their lives. You've changed Absolutely. the lives of the, their kids. And chances are their children and their grandchildren will no longer, would not be programmed to go into the system, right. which has it. So We hope so. It's so, right. so it's 60 percent plus, and that's good. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep increasing it. Right. Okay, we'll, we'll have the PSA, and then we'll come back and talk about prescription drugs. Okay. Look for the bare necessities. The bare necessities of healthy living are easier than you think. You better believe it. All it takes is the right balance of being active and eating well. And the food pyramid shows you the way. Just remember, every color, every day. With just the bare necessities of life. Crazy. So eat right. Be active. Now move. That's it. And have lots of fun. <laughs> for your own path to a healthier you, visit mypyramid.gov. I am folding the pants. The pants are long. <laughs> Do they go on my head? Do they? Do the pants go on my head? No. Do they go on Everyday my head? moments can become teaching moments because learning starts long before school does. Give your child the start they need at bornlearning.org. My sadness and depression grew out of giving myself to my career before I would give myself to myself. I didn't want to tell my parents. I, I really didn't want to tell anybody, and I didn't. I shut down. Giving voice to what you're feeling is part of the healing. The healing is in me and can also be extended to others. If you're strong enough to just open your mouth, that's all it takes. Hi, I'm Terry Williams. Can I tell you that it is way past time for us to come face to face with the issue of mental illness in the black community? Time for us to stop hiding it behind closed doors. Share ourselves. Healing starts with us. Well, thank you. We're back. We're going to talk about um, prescription drugs. And I'll kind of lead off when I was when I was going over your paperwork, what I found really shocking, and I guess you did too, that last year in New Hampshire, <clears throat> more people died of prescription drug overdose than died in car accidents and were murdered in the state of New Hampshire. That's a pretty scary f fact. It's such the, the kicker, you know, that um, we actually have the distinction of being the first in the nation for having that type of stat, where our um, accidental deaths caused by overdoses are higher than car accidents. It's 160 versus 130, um, and that's from the, the chief medical examiner. So, um, you know, you think about all the efforts that go into car crashes and preventing them, highway safety, etc. cetera. Um, you know, we've got a big problem there. We've got a big problem because I would probably think, even though maybe anecdotal, that some of those 130 car deaths and car accidents they probably had um, some drugs in their system they should not have had. Right. You hear that from, from when you talk to uh, state police. You will hear that uh, a lot of the uh, um, highway stops um, will involve prescription drugs when they search the vehicles. 
that there will be these prescription drugs there. Maybe they're not um, the persons, you know, that they were prescribed to or, or that they're just, you know, in excess in the, in the glove compartment or something. And so one of the things we're talking about is we're going to talk about a prescription drug take back. Right. What is that program and who does it involve? Well, we've had two of these take-back programs uh, in the past several months uh, in the area. It's the first um, in <laughs> New Hampshire, first in the area um, for these programs. And what we're looking to do is uh, collect and destroy safely um, excess medications from people's medicine cabinets. So um, we know the stats um, will show, and I can, I can share some of these stats, um, that prescription drugs are just in abundance in people's homes. Um, in their medicine cabinets that um, I'm sure if we just walked down the block uh, and, uh, you know, uh, spoke to people, they would share that, um, okay, we've got some excess painkillers from an old surgery you know, a couple of years ago, or there's something else and my doctor prescribed, changed my prescription, or I had side effects and I couldn't take them anymore. And they're just there and they're forgotten. And <clears throat> we were talking... Um a couple of weeks ago, and I, was, I have a, a broken back, and sometimes mm -hmm. the pain is excruciating. And when I went home, and it's like, holy crap, I still have morphine pills mm -hmm. in, in my house, but I have the grandkids running around. Right. And again, reading your stats, two-thirds of all the children that go to the emergency room for poisoning is they were able to get in the prescription or over-the-counter drugs left around the house? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's more so that they're getting into prescription drugs than they are um, household cleaners. Um, and we know that is a big issue in itself. Um, so just the, the accessibility of having prescription drugs around the house um, is a major issue. Uh, you know, I don't know how many folks have their um, medicine cabinets that are able to be locked up, but I, I think that it's pretty rare and that um, medications are fairly accessible, that you know, people know where to get them, and, and sometimes they're just, they're just around because you don't really think about it day to day. I don't, I don't think I can ever, I've known anybody that has a locked medicine cabinet. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I go to the doctors, but no one in their house seems to have a, a locked medicine cabinet. Right. A lot of times you just go right to the bathroom and it kind of reminds me of that Southwest um, airline commercial <laughs> when the lady opens up the and everything falls out. Uh -huh. And it's, so yeah. if, if I'm having a party at my house and I have my medicine there, and you're right, <clears throat> so some of them like Oxycontin, which would fall in the hero, heroin class, Yes, right. someone could go up and take them. And right. I've, that's I've heard all sorts of stories. You know, I mean, if, if you keep your medicines um, on the ground floor, which, you know, uh, one of the recommendations here that I'll give is that you don't do that where you, where you have the medications in a, in a um, bathroom that's used by guests and things like that. But, you know, if, if they're there, you know, people can go and visit and uh, take a peek around and take something. And, and it's very hard to track how many medications you have in, in each bottle. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's part of the problem is, is the accessibility of it. One of the other ones which... We're talking about a health care cost going through the roof, prescription mm -hmm. medicine. When you, your statistics show that over 40% of the medicines that people get are never used. That's right. an awful waste of a lot of money. It sure is. I mean, you know, when you, um, it's just, it's amazing that uh, we've got so many unused medications. I think that um, it was just never anticipated that we'd have this many, that, uh, you know, when, when they would be prescribed, they'd be taken in full by the patient, and they'd be done. But what we've seen is this increase of prescriptions. Um, I believe it's over the past 20 years, there have been three times as many prescriptions for just painkillers. Um, uh, and, and that they've just been accumulating in people's households. When you're talking about prescription, oh, as it one of your statistics was saying there was over 200, well, about 220 million prescriptions last year. There's only 300 million people in the United States. <laughs> an awful lot don't um, have prescription medicines. That's an awful lot of prescriptions. And you're right. How do you keep track of all those prescriptions? Right. And uh, oftentimes, it's, uh, some people are, 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 there's a stat that, that just came out, actually, um, where um, people were, were surveyed and, and 
those who filled a prescription um, medication for painkillers, they had filled a previous one in the past 30 days. So that it's, it's before the even, even the drug is, is finished that they're taking more and more medications. So you've got to wonder, where are these going and what's being done with the medications? The, um, when you talk about what's been done with the medication, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that dump their medications down the sink. Right. That doesn't seem to be a very good idea either. You know, flush down the toilet, put it, pour it down the sink. Um, you know, these medications are showing up in our water supply. And what's more alarming is that it's, it's happening even after the water's been treated. It's just that we don't have the technology or the resources to be able to um, filter out all these pollutants. And they call them um, personal care products because there are others such as, um, you know, creams and other medications and uh, other personal care products, you know, like you use in the morning routine that, that are showing up in the, in the water supply. The, um, the other kind of statistic you, you were talking about is prescription drugs is right up there with marijuana for use for high school children. It's, it's just downright, you know, astounding. Um, 30 years ago, not even close to this problem. But now it is second only to marijuana in, in recreational use. That kids are, you know, marijuana's top, and then prescription drugs, you know, they're, they're tiny, a lot of these prescription drugs. And they look like candy, and you could hide them. You could trade them. I mean, it, you know, they have a little bit of a novelty effect because they come in different shapes, colors, um, and they seem innocuous. That um, the pills, you know, they, they look like candy. When you take it, and there's not this kind of, um, um, how, how do I put it? It's not the same type of illicit, you know, uh, that you know you're doing something wrong. You know, that, that if there's needles, let's say, for heroin, that, you know, I would think that, that there's something obvious that you feel like there's something wrong with it for most people. Um, but prescription drugs, it's, um, the perception of risk is just so low. Well, because when you talk about, you know, if we want to watch the movies, yeah, someone's shooting up, they got mm-hmm. the needle marks, or someone who's taking cocaine, they may be sniffing. Sure. <clears throat> right. But the, even if you watch the movies, or a kid gets drunk, but there just doesn't seem any description mm-hmm of a kid taking on prescription drugs. Right, it's, it's pretty scary because you can't even tell that somebody's taken one, not, not by other th- methods you'd be able to because let's say somebody smoked marijuana, you'd be able to smell, smell it, it on their person. Or the clothes. Yeah, yeah they're, they're on, their, on their clothes, there'd be a pipe, there'd be, there'd be contraband, you know, things associated with it. Um, prescription drugs, <clears throat> I mean, okay, you've got a pill bottle, but sometimes you don't even have that and it's, and it's just gone. And the effect happens later, and it can have just a variety of effects where, you know, not necessarily you get bloodshot eyes, or not necessarily it would be one thing or the other, that um, behavior would change, or people would be feeling, you know, high, and you wouldn't necessarily know it. Because it's kind of like my little morphine pill, the little mm-hmm. purple one. It looks just like one of those little dot sugar candies that are on a piece of paper. Uh-huh. You, you, if, the, if one of my grandkids picked it up, they would just think it, it's a candy. But some of the consequences it could have, well, morphine slows down your breathing system. Right. And so if you and I, and you have really bad asthma, and I trade you a morphine, and mm-hmm. then you have a really serious asthma attack, who knows? Right. And no they, one's going to know that you're on morphine. How do they treat you at mm-hmm. that critical moment? That's, that's true. Let's say there's a first responder, and, and they wouldn't necessarily know. I mean... You know, they might do a drug test or some kind of panel, but... Um, it could be too late. Right, right. And it does have that double effect if somebody has asthma or, you know, if somebody's been drinking and they're taking... You know, it, drinking impairs judgment. <laughs> impaired judgment leads to, um, <clears throat> you know, not the best choices. Yeah. And uh, prescription drugs, I mean, you know, if they're around, um, they might very well be taken. The, um, the other prescription drug, what you, you talk about, Ritalin which mm-hmm. is an amphetamine, almost the equivalent of speed. Right. We know of um, <clears throat> kids who crush them and snort them. We know kids who take them mm-hmm. because they think it's great when they're taking a big exam, they got a crash for them. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But again, that's a, that's a prescription drug. It's easily to get. Right, right. But how does anybody know if the children are on it? 
And we know that they're, they're doing this um, to some extent. You know, there's, there's a survey in the schools. It's very um, highly regarded. It's an anonymous survey that's done every two years. It's called the uh, Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, and the kids will be asked a slew of, of health-related questions, and it's a self-reporting mechanism. And one of the questions is asked, uh, have you ever taken a prescription drug without a doctor's order in your lifetime? And 22% have indicated yes. That could be any number of medications. It could be allergy medications. It could be blood pressure. But, but we know that some of those are addictive medications, such as morphine and the Ritalin and Xanax and things like that. And uh, it's, it's just plain old dangerous, you know, because you never know who's going who's gonna to find it to be their drug of choice. When you talk about all these excess um, <clears throat> prescription drugs around the house, mm-hmm. But a lot of parents don't want to admit it, mm-hmm. but they go, well, you know what? Johnny or Susie's not feeling too good. I've got this drugs, so I will give um, Johnny or Susie this because it helped me. But I think the parents are sending a mixed message. They're telling the kids it's all right to use someone else's prescription drugs without a doctor. Right. But on the other side, that prescription drug was given for an adult not a kid that is still growing. Oh, it's, it's uh, obviously that would be not under a doctor's advisement and different chemicals have different effects for different people. There are allergies that could happen. Um, it, it's just, it's obviously not a, a, a productive thing to do, a good thing to do, um, but we know that it does happen. I mean, we've, we've, heard, we've heard things where, where people don't feel like they want to waste the medications or they want to help or that um, why not, you know, that um, we had little Johnny, you know, crash on a skateboard and, um, you know, was in dire pain or something. Uh, and, and, and the medications are around. So um, it's not... Um, Good intentions, dumb. Uh, dumb well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, a, it's dumb ex- execution for sure. <laughs> well, what I find kind of strange, parents will lock up their liquor cabinet. Mm-hmm. Kind of go Good what you're talking about, but they won't lock up the prescription drugs. Right. It's it's not really thought of as as a danger, and that's part of the the challenge that we're we're trying to face here is that we have to acknowledge that you know of course you have to acknowledge yeah. that there is a problem, um, and that it's right here in everybody's um, medicine cabinets. You were going to tell. Um, <clears throat> some of those little scary statistics. I know sure. you're not going to go back to where um, just say no or scare mm-hmm. the hell out of kids like used to when we were growing up when they were just talking about all these scary things. And <clears throat> right now, it's to me, I kind of look at it, we used to separate uh, good kids use cocaine, bad kids use crack. Hmm. But you can't do that because prescription drugs is being used by everybody. Right. It, it is very pervasive, and it's um, causing such a burden on society. I mean, we, we've got these, these ODs happening. We've got these visits to the emergency room happening. Um, but people are becoming addicted, and they're seeking out treatment, and it's affecting every part of their lives because addiction is just its so um, consuming. Um, if, if we just ask the Phoenix House, for example, statistics show from them that, that it, has, um, it is the second most um, presenting cause why people go to, go to their treatment centers. It's right behind alcohol. So that, um, you know, people are, are wanting the help, they are needing the help. Um, and it's, it's, it boils down to, again, prescription drugs. Well, if you look at some of the addictions... I have to pay for cigarettes, mm-hmm. I have to pay for alcohol, I have to pay for a lot of these other drugs. In a lot of cases, prescription drugs are free. Isn't that something? <laughs> that that you, you get them, um, well, through insurance or you get samples or... And it's someone just laying around. Mm-hmm. When, when I get my drugs from the military, I get 90, day, um, <clears throat> 90 days. Mm-hmm. That's an awful lot of medicines, and like you were talking earlier, you have an overlap. It says order for seven to ten days. Mm-hmm. Well, if I take four a day, all of a sudden that's 30 extra pills. 
how do I ever notice that every three months? Right. So you'll get, for, for the military, so you're saying that you'll get 90 right off the bat. I get 90 days. Every, I get my, I get 90 days. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> for example, the head injury, I, mm-hmm. I have to take four a day. Mm-hmm. So that's 360 pills that right. I get in the big, two big bottles. And, <laughs> and it's kind of like mm-hmm. <clears throat> if I had kids at home who wanted to, to use them and stuff, I would never know. Sure. I mean, there's a supply that's right up front that, that you get through the mail. And, and, and um, your condition aside, I mean, not everybody needs 90 days. Yeah. You know, some people need 10 days or just the two days. And where people go to the ER or they go to see their provider and they get supplied, you know, 30 days standard. Yeah. This is just what, what, what's done. You might need it. Um, you know, we call that over prescribing. And I think you know, obviously, uh, that can be a major issue. Well, they go and say, if I go and see, we go up to the VA and that says, okay, here it is, I'm mm-hmm. going to do your prescription for a year. And so... For a year. It's for a year. <laughs> and so every 90 days, I mm-hmm. get 300. So it'd be kind of like, I'm getting almost 1,500 pills over the course of the year, and I don't have to see the, the doctor at all until the next year. And again, there's no way in the world right. that I could keep track of those. And, and obviously it's troubling. I mean, this, this part that we haven't even spoken about is, is that um, it can be very profitable to, to sell them on the street. You know, that uh, uh, if somebody wanted to steal them and, and sell them, obviously, you know, they're, they're worth something, that it's a big crime, uh, felony level crimes, matter of fact. And so <clears throat> as you're getting ready to the, um, the prescription drug take back, mm-hmm. and what type of prescription drugs are you willing to take back? Well, actually, we'll take back pretty much any and all drugs. Um, and that includes prescription drugs. It includes over-the-counter drugs, too, because while over-the-counters um, are often not ad- addictive for the most part, uh, that, uh, you know, they're still available in the households, and, there's, and they could still be a source f- uh, for accidental <coughs> poisonings. So we're taking everything. Um, there are some limitations that we can't take back. It's just because, you know, there, there's, um, we can't control for blood-borne pathogens, so we can't take back a sharps or needles, yeah. um, syringes, et cetera. Um, so we, we just simply can't take those back, and that there are other methods um, that uh, we can, we, we have resources um, where you can dispose of those things. But it's any and all prescription medications um, in pill form or, or, or whatever, um, and what people need to do is um, have them in their original packaging. Uh, they can black out their name and address and mm. um, prescription number and other any, any other um, patient mm. identifying information if there's privacy mm. concerns. Um, and they bring them to any one of our 15 sites that we'll have on April 30th, which is a Saturday, for disposal at, at, a, at a police station. And so could you list some of the communities that... Can oh, sure. I mean, basically, if, if you're in this area, you won't be 10 minutes from a drop-off site. Um, it, it is just scattered all throughout the county. I mean, certainly we have, we have sites in Keene, uh, Keene State, and uh, Keene Police Department, Swansea Police Department. Um, we're having a site in Hinsdale, Antrim, Francistown, Bennington. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, it's, it's just... We have so many participating police departments, and it's really um, a credit to the law enforcement partners that they feel that this is important to them because, you know, you hear it from them that this is an issue in, in crime in the area, and so they, they're partnering with us to, uh, to participate. It's, a, <clears throat> it's an issue, and the great majority of police don't want to have to arrest somebody mm-hmm. and put them to jail. They're more into the community base. Right. How can we prevent this from happening? And the other part is whether you're a policeman or a fireman, you don't want to have to go and tell a parent that uh-huh. the child is passed on and even say it was needlessly from a prescription drug overdose. Right. How horrible. You know, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Um, you know, something, something else about prescription drugs and why they're so dangerous is that um, it, you don't know what you're going to get with the prescription drugs. Um, th- we know that the leading prescription drugs in particular um, is methadone, um, and that's used as a, a heroin um, substitute and also a pain management mm-hmm. pill. Um, 
a typical dose, you know, will be somewhere I think in the in the 20 milligram mark, 20 to 40. When, but when people take them, um, the effect is really delayed. So, so, you know, I've heard things where you know people are disappointed when they take a methadone because it will create this euphoric feeling um, for somebody that's not prescribed to, and if you're abusing it, um, but they get disappointed and disappointed for the first hour. So they take another one. And then, you know, you've got this double dose and then it hits. And that's something that could um, depress your, your um, nerve system and, and where your, your breathing will stop. And when you talk about you not knowing what you get, well, <clears throat> some of my medications, mm-hmm. when I get every 90 days, it's a totally different pill, different color. Oh. And it says, this is the same as mm-hmm. such and such. Generic or something. <clears throat> Okay. But so if I'm, so if I go and say, oh yeah, if I'm not actually reading the, um, the prescription mm-hmm. bottle, it's like, oh yeah, blue and yellow. But next week it may, and so if they're oh, all wow. changing, and so if mm-hmm. I'm if if I had again a, a kid that was taking one of my um, blue and yellows, and then three months from now, what was blue and yellow is another prescription, and mm-hmm. this one's changed. Right. Again, you don't have no idea what you're taking. And who could spell any of these medications? <laughs> you know, you, you, you read them. I mean, clonidine is, is a blood pressure medication. Clonopin is, is a benzodiazepine and um, is addictive. You know, so, so it's, it's this mix. And, and, you know, I hadn't heard that before about the, about the colors, but that makes perfect sense, you know, with the substitutions. And, you know, if you get these pills from a, from a program that mail them to you or something. They're always going to go who's going to give them the, the, the lowest price, and they're always changing right. vendors. Right, <clears throat> and um, we had talked about. Let's see. Tw- you were talking about. We were talking about before. Twenty-two percent of the um, the students. Yes, uh, about one in five that, that reported um, that they've taken prescription drugs without without a script. Uh, I mean, and, and kids are taking are taking over the counters um, to get high as well. Um, um, I think we've covered quite a bit. I'm just going through going through some of my notes. Um, you know, something that we can we can touch on is is the um, issue of doctor shopping. Oh yes, um, it's uh, doctor shopping is where there's an, there's a, a um, an illness. It's either legitimate. It can be very much illegitimate if somebody is is seeking medications. You know, uh, oh, you know, I've got something wrong. It could, you know, you pick, you pick the, the diagnosis, I guess. Um, and they will seek out the doctor, go from hospital to hospital, sometimes, I guess, with even in the same hospital, um, for somebody who, who will supply them the 30, 60, 90 day supply of things um, and fill them at different pharmacies. It could be actually the same script, forged, altered to different pharmacies. And so we get this, we get this um, issue, especially in the state of New Hampshire, and I'll explain why in a second, uh, that one pharmacy is not speaking to the other, other pharmacy, either different chains and they just don't have the right computers, uh, or, or one provider is not speaking to the other provider. Um, and so there's no tracking or accountability for where the pills are coming from and uh, how often somebody gets a supply of, let's say, OxyContin. Um, and uh, it can be ready, it can be a, a, just a, an easy to access supply, unfortunately. Um, and now, there, there's obvious um, solutions to this, and all but New Hampshire have implemented some kind of it. Um, they're called prescription monitoring programs, um, otherwise known as PMPs. And what these are, obviously, would be to communicate with one another. Um, pharmacy knows pharmacy A knows what pharmacy B is prescribed. If they've already filled 30 days of that OxyContin, can't get it from pharmacy B. It's it's fairly simple. Uh, and uh, every state in New England, again, are, is implementing this, but New Hampshire. Um, in New Hampshire, bills have been introduced, <laughs> I think, for the past four years. Um, they've started in the House, they've started in the Sen- Senate, and there's been an issue um, there's every one, year. <clears throat> there's one particular representative, mm-hmm. up th- and I would then kind of call him as a Privacy Act um, paranoia. Okay. And um, <clears throat> we've had some of them more libertarians and some of the free staters who will go and say, you know what, uh, <clears throat> uh, personal identity must be um, 
completely protected. Right. right. And but then you, you come into the point is like you're talking <clears throat> prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. Prescription drugs that we were talking earlier, it's pretty abusive. And people go doctor shopping so they can sell the Oxycon. I've heard in the past that Oxycon and, and some Vicodin can go up to ten dollars a pill. Right. And so if I get thirty Oof. extra pills, I could get an extra three hundred bucks. And mm -hmm. people go, who cares? Well, who, who cares? You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's affecting all of us. Uh, you know, I mean, if if we've got drug driving, we've got um, people in the community who are who are becoming addicts. Uh, and we. We've had a couple of, um, over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. we've had the, um, the drugstores robbed because mm -hmm. people who were addicted to Oxycontin right. won. The... And you'll go to some drugstores that will say no Oxycontin on, on, on premises, like they used to say, oh, no yeah, cash we, on hand. We see, those, we see those signs now, right. Um, you know, but, but to get to the issue of privacy, I mean, sure, there's, there has to be some legitimacy to... Um, advocating that, you know, to some extent there's just going to be this, you know, to put it negatively, big brother watching who is filling what and what prescriptions uh, do, do folks have. Um, you know, but this is not unlike what we already have. I mean, you know, your pharmacy already knows what you're being prescribed. Your doctor already knows. It's in your me medical record. Um, this is simply a safeguard so that there cannot be abuses of the system. Um, you know, it, it's really a no, a no brainer. Um, and you know, to, to further extent, I mean, New Hampshire's got a long way to go, to even put in the first, the first program. But uh, even for the states that have prescription monitoring programs, they're coming across the the issue where states don't communicate across borders. And so, you know, what we're seeing is that okay, at least there's an awareness of the problem, and that um, there are measures to to implement. You know, but obviously they all cost money. It, it creates, it, it takes time to develop, and um, there are certainly some some hurdles to even um, start um, participating yeah. in this program. Like from from the provider's point of view, um, they have to go and check the database. You know, before yeah. they write a script, that's that's uh, that's a significant step. Yeah. You know, that even before they write the script for OxyContin, that um, they'd be asked to check to see if, you know, Dr. B has already uh, written a prescription for that. So, you know, it's certainly challenging, but I, in New Hampshire there's obvious opportunities uh, for improvement. My, my first session in the House, we had um, DEA came to the committee I was on, the state and federal, mm -hmm. and they had a concern. And they had gone through and they showed us a whole bunch of graphs. Four doctors in New Hampshire prescribed over 80% of the Ritalin. Wow. When you're talking about doctor shopping, and it was kind of like it was said, hey, if you think your kid's on AD, AD, ADD or mm -hmm. ADHD, right. go see doctor such and such. And he had, his only treatment was basically his, his Ritalin prescription, his Ritalin prescription. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and 60 minutes about a year ago, we talked talk about kind of on um, strip malls, doctors that are given all types of prescription for Oxycontin and other ones. Right. And are you really solving the underlying problem? <laughs> are you really affecting the ADD? <clears throat> um, you know, you've got, you've got to wonder, you know, if it's, if it's just a Band-Aid on, on, a, on an issue. Um, and obviously, I mean, with the, with the four prescribing, 80%, uh, there, there's, there's something wrong with that. And I'm glad that the DEA <laughs> knew about it. <laughs> <clears throat> because... They, I guess DEA keeps track of all the prescriptions that doctors do, even though in New Hampshire. And right. that kind of goes to Big Brother. If you're mm -hmm. worrying about privacy, DEA already tracks. And I noticed sure. more recently, every single, do even my dentist has to write a DEA number on the prescription. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a tracking number for, for <clears throat> controlled substances. Yeah, it's, it's these heavy hitters like the Oxys and Percocets and stuff. And... Um, <clears throat> And so, again, parents are then also setting up the wrong example because mm -hmm. here it is, let's go get a drug, go get a drug. TV goes, this prescription drugs all day long, mm -hmm. names that you can't even spell. Yeah. On, on TV. Uh, on, on, on TV right? and say, hey, yeah. and now it's getting to the point is, I've seen them, if you can't afford it, call us, we may even right. give you your first month free. 
Right. Uh, that's, a, that's some kind of message. Huh? I mean, you know, I, there, there's, uh, there's kind of two ways to take that message, I guess. Um, you know, the, this advertising that we see on TV, another interesting stat that I ran, came across mm-hmm. was that uh, we are one of two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> you know, it, it's a advertising. You're creating this demand. You're creating this awareness of it so that people go and find it. Um, and is that healthy for, for a, a nation? <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're um, uh, it's the U.S. and it's New Zealand. And New Zealand is thinking about outlawing it. And I used to joke with my wife and then I said, maybe this is not a joke. And I would go, when it goes and says, go ask your doctor. And I'm saying this, if I went to my doctor for something and he doesn't know about it, why would I still want to go to him? Or her, why shouldn't I go to a doctor that is right. up to snuff, up the grade of what's mm-hmm. going on? Just to say, here it is, here's $300 for my visit, and what about this medicine? What about, th-? and him right. to say, well, I don't know, I'll have to go check. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, doctors are professionals yeah. for sure, but they're also people too, you know, and when they have a, a, a client asking them for a particular medicine, um, they're compelled to respond, and it, it puts that medication first on the list, um, you know, in their mind. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of something that might be more appropriate. And yes, it should be the doctor <laughs> who knows which prescription to, to uh, prescribe, you know, using this kind of objective Co- knowledge that they have of what works best. But we're not getting that. The, um, you know, to get back to the prescription, sure. I heard it on the radio, the prescription take back. Great. Are there going to be other advertising? Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm <laughs> glad you asked. Uh, what we're trying to do, this. This is a uh, DEA-sponsored event, which means that the DEA um, is coming to, um, uh, they will pick up the medications after they're collected by us uh, and destroy the medications. But with, um, with some of, of the uh, knowledge that we have about the DEA, they are not going to do this all the time. No. We have to figure out how to do this on our own, and that there are, there are methods of doing this, but, but we're trying to create some consistency so that um, it's not the DEA sponsoring it this time and it looks like something else, and that we're doing it this time and it looks like something totally different. Um, what we've done in the past two events, and this is our third, is uh, have um, this logo up. This is a medication disposal take back. You know, we're trying to create this um, um, signage so that people are, are familiar and will recognize it. Um, you'll see this. This was developed actually with a media collaboration. Um, it's with the Keen Sentinel, the Mananoc Shopper, uh, the, um, the Ledger Transcript, and also the Mananoc Radio Group um, helped in designing this and helping with our whole advertising campaign um, and sponsoring in part mm-hmm. what we're doing. Um, and they've done a, a wonderful job. I mean, if you go on to um, the Sentinel website, for example, They'll have a running banner um, that's uh, one of a handful of banners. So if you refresh the web page every now and then, you'll come across this. And um, they also have this other um, larger advertisement where it's all of these, these signs with, um, with our stats. So if you roll over with your mouse, all, this, all these stats will, will come down. And uh, you click on it and you get to our website. You can see the sites where we're holding the event and kind of um, more information about it. So... Anybody who gets the Keen Sentinel or the Mananoc shop, the Keen mm-hmm. Shopper or, or the Ledger, this will be in right. there. Right, and hopefully it's recognizable because <clears throat> this is this is not new, really. This this advertising campaign. Um, last time we ran the ad, we had it. Um, you know, you open up the newspaper and you've got the back of the fold. We had a big, huge advertisement, um, and it should be very similar, especially within the next two weeks leading up to the event. And so, like, I know for the dump, mm-hmm. the dump takes back hazardous chemicals. And like you the script, they got to right. be separated and labeled. All right, right. But it limits who takes it. So I know you're going to have it at the college, but that answers one part. But what happens if I work in Keene or, <clears throat> but I don't live in Keene? Or, <clears throat> or what happens if one of the places I live don't, don't have a truck? Do I have to prove that I'm a resident to turn it in? You don't have to prove you're a resident at all. This will be completely free. It's completely anonymous um, that you show up 
and it's very simple. Really, you've got your medications, you drop them. Um, we'll have some of our um, local um, anti-drug and, and uh, anti-alcohol coalitions there, the prevention coalitions, mm -hmm. I should call them. Um, and they'll be administering um, some voluntary surveys just to get some data about, um, you know, did you see the, the advertisement or um, what caused you to come out, just so we know how to develop our program more. Um, but really, participation will be a minute or two at most, just be able to come in and drop it off and then leave. And when I was going through your data and basically what mm -hmm. you were saying is, yeah, DEA does it and, and you have one of these. You're talking about hopefully creating a, a program so right. three months from now and it's three months before the next one and I've got these drugs and I don't want to flush them down the toilet but I don't want to keep them around the house. Mm -hmm. Right. As a matter of fact, you mentioned uh, the hazardous waste program at, at the dump. Um, we are starting conversation with, with, with some of those programs and to see if there's a way to integrate this with, with the hazardous waste collection because it, it's a lot of the same properties, right? I mean, if you'd, you'd want to dispose of med medications the same you dispose of paint, batteries, or electronics, mm -hmm. why not? Um, just want to make people aware that the reason why this, uh, we have to do events like this mm -hmm. and why it's, it's not as easy as just bringing it to let's say, Chris Roberts' house, you know, he's going to go to dispose of medications. Um, you know, we're talking about controlled substances and, and these um, oxys and everything. Um, and it's a felony to commit to, to possess a medication that you don't have a prescription for. And so it's just against the law to, to pass these back and forth. And that's why we need to have these at the police department right now, um, where police departments are volunteering um, or participating their, their time um, and their staff and they'll be accepting medications and then these will be disposed. Um, I do want to point out that there is legislation um, that uh, has passed the Senate or no, it's, it's passed the uh, committee in the Senate, the Health and Human Services um, uh, Committee in the Senate and it will be going to vote for the to, at the full Senate uh, on April 20th and this is um, House Bill 71 it's a pharmaceutical take-back bill, which will allow these medication take-back programs to happen so much easier than they are now. Um, so that we don't need the DEA, let's say, to help us dispose of these medications. Um, we could do these on our own. They could be a regular occurrence. Um, it's very, very possible that we have a 24-7 drop box at a location where you don't have to go um, on, a, on a Saturday to, to a police department to drop off meds. That, it's convenient, and you know we'll we'll find a location where you just drop it off any old time you want to. You know, just just dawn on me what you're talking. Sure. <clears throat> so, if I go to dentist, have a tooth pulled, I get a Percocet. My child later months from now gets hurt, mm -hmm. and I give my child a perc. I just committed a felony, because in in theory. Yeah, in theory, it, right? I mean, it's it's no different mm -hmm. than. Um, me giving, going out and buying booze for my 14-year-old, right. it, it's, it's a crime. It's and a potential, that, it's a potential crime. It's, mm -hmm. it's and a it reason could, for that. Right? You know, it's a reason for that. It's because these have <clears throat> high, high um, potential for addictions. And if I have, we were talking about alcohol, mm -hmm. if I allow my kids to have a party and underage drinking at my house, I'm under some, not only is it illegal, but I can come under some really civil penalties. Right. I could be sued. The liability. The right. liability. Right. Same thing if, if I'm giving my, my kids some prescription drugs and they happen to pass it on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't think some mm -hmm. of these parents realize some of the positions they could putting themselves in both <clears throat> legally and, and civil liabilities. Right, right. And, and you know, there's this two more things that I want to make sure that we, we talk about, which is um, uh, why don't we recycle these medications? Okay. And, um, and also, what are we doing with the medications to dispose of these things? Um, we're disposing of the medications. I realize that it feels wasteful to a lot of people, but it, there's simply no safe way to um, prescribe a medication, get it out in the community, and then take it back and know that it's the same pill and then to get it back into somebody else's hands and so that they could take it safely. There's just no way to do it. Hopefully we'll get there someday. The other thing is that uh, 
will be incinerating these medications. That is the disposal method mm -hmm. that we'll be using, so that it's much better than pouring it down the drain or flushing down the toilet. Um, we're using incinerators that are safe, and it will control for air quality much better than water quality. And so we got about 10 seconds. Is sure. there anything you want to highlight? What, what, app, what is a good number if someone wants to call for this if they don't have the paper? Well, we're, we're at, uh, I'll give you a website. It's okay. monadnockvoices.org. Okay. Um, that's our regional network for substance abuse. Um, 10 to 2, Saturday, April 30th. Uh, come to any of our participant PDs and dispose of your meds. Okay, well, thank you. Hopefully it's thank really you. successful. I'm really glad and to be here. Thank you. And so I hope everybody enjoys it, and we'll see you on the next